Hey guys, here we are about a week later and I'm busy recapping this whole set. Uh, I have already replaced quite a few of the paper caps and I unmounted both of the twist lock electrolytics and dug out the insides and I built up new caps. So this is the main filter cap here and these are other various electrolytics uh, mainly for the audio circuits. So I'll need to recrimp these bases and then remount them and hook them back up. It's a log shop, but I figured what the heck, I might as well see if I can repair this focus control. So I unsoldered all the connections and here's the control. This large suction, that's the wire wound focus control that seems to be bad. Then we've got the volume control and the power switch. Looks like all I gotta do is carefully pry up four tabs there and I can pop this section open and see what's inside. If I'm lucky there might just be a simple break in the wire and I can solder it back together and get this thing working again. Alright, I managed to get it open, pried those tabs up and carefully work this section loose and there I do believe are where the brakes are get the center shaft out and we can see it better so here's the wiper it comes right out and there we go so there all the turns of the resistive wire so the brakes are close to one end and of course it's very very fine wire but you know what I bet I can do since it looks like those two blown open parts are near one end I might have to just put a glob of solder and just you know glom all that end together which will reduce the overall resistance of this a bit Probably not too much to care, but I can compensate for that by adding an extra resistance on the end. So say I knock it off by 100 ohms, I can put a 100 ohm resistor on this leg before it goes to the wire. That'd uh, be a close approximation. Now the central wiper, if I do that, won't be able to go all the way fully to this end. There'll always still be a bit of resistance here, but generally the focus, uh, the proper focus is going to be in the center of the range somewhere over here anyways so I'm not too concerned about that so I'm gonna give that a try maybe I'll get lucky here's a simple little test that confirms where the break in that wire is I've got a clip at this end and here's my ohmmeter probe and I can touch it to any point along this coil and get a reading so now I'm down near this end and we get a very low resistive reading move up over here reading jumps up to about half a K move over here and resistance keeps going up as I move around the coil now over 1k get down near that break about one and a half K and then right near the end here where we saw those solder or blobs on the wire that looked like it fried no resistance so I'm down right around here if I back up a little bit right about there I start getting a reading again this is supposed to be a 1.5 K pot so you can see I've lost like the last 100 and 22 ohms or so of that wiper so if I can bridge those breaks in the wire there with some solder we should be in business I just need to make sure when I solder that that I don't get a blob that will block the wiper action on the control I quickly discovered that soldering to this wire which I suspect is nichrome wire it's just not going to happen with lead-based solder. I did a little research online and found that 
uh, silver solder might work or there are various type of fluxes like acid based fluxes that can help but I don't have any of that type of flux on hand and I don't think this control could withstand the high heat needed for silver solder if it would even work and I read another suggestion uh, for repairing an old radio rheostat which was to simply wedge a bit of conductive material to bridge the gap so what I did is I dug up some cir old circuit boards that had gold plated traces on them peeled it off the circuit board material and then wedged that in there there's just a small gap between these windings and the outer housing so I wedged a little piece down in there and now I've got my conductivity back I'm going to secure that a bit with some super glue and then give this control a try. I finished recapping the set and replacing any out of spec resistors. And there were quite a few, including a whole bunch in the IF strip. So next up I want to do an alignment. Here's the repaired focus rheostat, and I did add a uh, oh, about a 220 ohm resistor, I believe, to one end of it to compensate for those windings that had uh, been shorted. Here's the IF cover. Better put that back on before I try doing an alignment. Goes like that. Bunch of screws hold it down here, a couple up here, and I noticed there was a big solder blob when I got it, so uh, I guess I'll get out my soldering gun and replicate that, get that uh, soldered back together. So after a full recap, does it work any better? Well, let's find out. Oh, I also cleaned up the set a bit with a damp cloth. And I repaired the loose CRT base with some Permatex windshield glass sealer. I've just got the set hooked to a pair of rabbit ears to pick up local Chicago low power VHF broadcast. Decent picture. Sounds fine. And I now have full height. If you recall, before, with the height at the full extent, it was only getting about this high. Now I can get all the height I want. No problem. And yeah, I think it looks better. But that's subjective. What I want to do next is actually hook this up to my leader LCG 400. In particular, the multi-burst unit, which sends out bursts at various frequencies, which you can use to see what kind of bandwidth you've got. Otherwise, like a BNK 1077B or pretty much any test pattern has some type of element in that test pattern you can use to determine the bandwidth usually some lines that come very close together so if you've got really awesome bandwidth all the way out to here you can see the vertical lines and distinguish them on the far right you'll see what i mean when i hook this up regardless i do plan on going through an alignment for a few reasons one it might need it two uh, in the past, I know you guys had some trouble telling what the heck I was doing. Well, I now have a tripod. Hooray. And this is probably the easiest set to align. At least the instructions are very easy. Because unlike the uh, Admiral chassis I've done in the past, this does not use stagger tuning. So... <laughs> Here's the video IF alignment instructions. Three steps. All you've got to do, well, once you've got all your equipment hooked up, 
is just peek some coils to these two frequencies and then check the overall alignment. That's it. And then later stages are for, uh, later instructions I should say, are for doing the audio and the tuner. But for the video IF, really, really simple. And because I did change a lot of capacitors and resistors in here, replaced a couple tubes, uh, I think it probably does need it. Okay, here's my test setup. Got the leader composite video output going to a blonder tongue RF modulator. This is a BAVM Z model. These models have a fixed frequency for the RF output. This one is set for channel 3. There are also agile blonder tongue modulators, which are much larger, but those you can set the output on any channel. But for our simple lab RF modulator, this works great. So, got that going to the video and put on the back there. And for the output, I'm using the output test jack on the front. These can put out quite a bit of RF power. They're meant to go through uh, coax to power like a whole building, like an apartment building. So that's the high power to output on the back. This test output is minus 30 dB. So, much lower level. And even so, I've got this output level set almost all the way down. Because the antenna input jacks on these sets are fairly sensitive. So, RF output at 75 ohms, going to a Balin, 75 ohm to 300 ohm, going to the antenna terminals. And here is what I get. So this is the alignment, or sorry, the, uh, yeah, they, they call it the alignment test pattern. I think of it more as a linearity test pattern, though, for checking the horizontal and vertical linearity. Now, I have really not made any adjustments on this set, and it's pretty darn good as it is. The idea is to get these squares to all be the same size and the circle, well, to be circular. Horizontal line linearity is off a little bit. The squares on the right are a little bit narrower than the ones on the left, but even so, that's pretty good. There is an adjustment for horizontal linearity on the back. We'll tweak that later. Here's another test pattern. They call this the convergence test pattern. Meant for color sets, really, but you can certainly use this to check the linearity as well. And the centering, this should be that center there. Here's the test pattern I was talking about for checking bandwidth. So we've got one, two, three, four, five sets of bursts here, and you should be able to distinguish, ideally, black and white lines in each of these blocks. Well, I can certainly see them on the left, and the next one, the middle one, kind of, and the other two, not so much. However, while I was fooling around with it, I noticed something. On all the patterns, there's a bit of a bit of a buzz, bit of a home. I mean, there's like some kind of like ripple going on, if you look close. Let's see if I can zoom in on that. See all that wavering in there? Well, I, f I started tracing my cables. I was thinking I'm getting interference leaking through somewhere. I don't have a good ground connection or something. Uh, then I got me thinking about this modulator. I'm not feeding any audio in. And they do have controls on the front for the audio carrier level and the video carrier level. And then I noticed that I had them turned up all the way. Well, if I just turn these down, we'll see that that interference goes away. And there we go. So, now let's recheck that bandwidth view. Yeah. Bandwidth. So now you can actually distinguish it better going at these higher frequencies. And actually, this is pretty good too, but I will still go through the alignment because now I want to make sure that the audio is aligned right. So it seems like a bit of the audio carrier is bleeding through into the video, and that's not a good thing because you get those sound distortion bars going on. Alright, so. 
next up disconnect all this stuff and hook up an RF generator and so on as I describe in the instructions you really can't just go off a generic description of how to align a set you've got to get the instructions in particular these came from Rider's service manual pretty much any model TV you're going to encounter somebody's got the instructions Sam's, Rider's, ask around online you'll be able to get a copy just like this and they tell you all the equipment you're going to need how to hook it up and what to do with it so once you study this and get familiar with your test equipment and how to hook it up it's actually fairly easy to go through I think okay first let's go through the tools that you're going to need they list them all here on the first page of the alignment procedure first up I mentioned an alignment toolkit these are the two tools that I use most often. One is a plastic tube with a metal slot at either end. It protrudes on one end and it's recessed on the other. These are very handy for fitting onto coil slugs that have slotted ends like this. You wiggle it around so it locks in and you twist the tube and it rotates the slug in and out. And this is a piece of plastic with the ends filed down like a flat bladed screwdriver. This is useful for coils with recessed slugs where you have to actually put this down into the coil and manipulate the slug inside of it. Alright, now for the electrical equipment. Sweep generator. It should cover these ranges. You need the first one, 18 to 30, to do the IF. 50 to 90 is for the lower frequency VHF channels, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I believe. And then 170 to 225 is for the higher frequency VHF channels. These I wouldn't worry about too much, the higher frequencies. Those I usually just do by eyeball and by ear, by manipulating the slugs in here while actually watching a broadcast and listening to it. For the IF, this is what you need, 18 to 30 megahertz. Marker generator, uh, that's pretty crucial too. That is a, an RF generator. They use this term marker generator, but really it's just an RF generator. In the past, uh, I used this Heathkit IG-102 worked really well. More recently I got a Leader 17A which I will be using for this alignment. Ideally you've got them calibrated otherwise get a frequency counter to make sure that you've got these set accurately. It's really important to have these accurate because you use these to locate critical points on the response curve and to actually do the alignment. Uh, which is uh, what they mentioned here for crystal calibrator or frequency counter. And they mentioned a signal generator for 4.5 and 18 to 225. Marker generator, signal generator, same thing. Some vintage sweep alignment generators have a marker generator built in with the sweep generator, and two dials side by side. In that case, you probably will need a separate RF generator because sometimes they don't have a separate marker output. In other words, the, the marker generator is just routed internally and tied into the sweep generator. You actually do need a separate standalone RF generator like this or this to feed in to do some of the specific alignment procedures like the 4.5 megahertz sound carrier. and an oscilloscope. You need this to view the output of the sweep generator and a VTVM. I'm going to be using an RCA Voltemist. You really can't use a digital multimeter or a VOM volt ohm meter. They, uh, well a volt ohm meter has too high, sorry, too low an input resistance. In other words, it'll load down the circuit. 
the probe, when you attach it to the circuit, goes into a circuit inside of here, in a VTVM, and it's actually amplified and has a very high input impedance, so it won't load down the circuit. A volt ohm meter typically is kind of a passive meter, and the, it draws current from the set to actually deflect the meter, and you can't use that with this kind of work. Digital multimeter may have high input impedance, but when you're trying to align this, you're going to watch some needles, it swings around, and that translated to the digital world will be flashing numbers, and it's very, very difficult to find a peak when you have a sample rate that's fairly low and the numbers just update every second or two. And that's it. Before I get into doing the actual alignment and tweaking any coils, I want to check the overall response curve. Because for all I know, it's not even necessary to do that. They have a series of specific instructions, which will vary on your set, and it will vary depending on what kind of equipment you've got. I will briefly run through the equipment that I've got and how it's hooked up. At the heart of my setup is this, a WaveTech model 1080 sweep generator. This is total overkill <laughs> for aligning a, uh, a TV or an FM radio for that matter. This will go from 1 to 1000 megahertz in one continuous sweep and it has all kinds of other built-in goodies like a built-in marker generator and various sweep modes and so on. Uh, briefly, I've got mine set up to do a delta F, which means it's going to vary in frequency. You can also do CW, which means it just works as a fancy RF generator. And full sweep goes the full 1 to 1000 megahertz. This frequency, that's my center frequency. I'm going to be varying it around 20 megahertz. Sweep width, this is how you, where you set how much it's going to be sweeping. They don't have any numbers on here, which is why you really need to use markers and a scope, because I just have this set on zero and then this control just in some arbitrary position. I could not tell you what the sweep width is just by looking at this. Output level, you want to use a pretty low output level, because this is going to some pretty sensitive amplifier so I've got this set to a minus 24 dB basically being fed into a 47 ohm load connectors RF that's the output that is going to this little setup here which is common at least on all the Admiral sets I've aligned this is the 6J6 oscillator mixer tube. What you do is you actually pop the shield up so it's not making contact with the chassis. It's floating. And you connect that shield to the high side of your RF output. So this whole shield is carrying the signal. And just having that signal on the shield will feed it into that tube. It's that sensitive. The other end, they say to ground as close to the tube as you can, so I have it clipped to the base of that tube shield, which is chassis ground. And then I have this resistor that I actually soldered right onto the end of the alligator clips. That's a load, so I don't get uh, reflections interfering with the RF signal. So the output of my RF generator is going to do a 50 ohm coax. And ideally that would be a 50 ohm non-inductive resistor, but eh, that works well enough. Next we have what they call the DMOD input. This is the actual signal coming back from your device under test. In this case, TV. They specifically tell you how to hook it up in the alignment info. Just right here. So this point V, you need to locate in the IF chain, and you tack in 10,000 ohm resistor and a 330 picofarad cap, which serves as a little bit of a demodulation filter, 
and that's where you connect the scope. One end of the resistor goes to this point V and the end of the capacitor to the IF shield. So there's my 10K resistor tacked in to that junction there, point V. And there's my 330 picofarad cap. Screwed it right under the IF shield. My scope, I've got the ground clip going right to that IF shield, and the signal is going right to that junction. And that goes to the DMOD input on the sweep generator. Next, we have vertical and horizontal scope connections. So, vertical horizontal, and if you look faintly on my scope, there's an X and a Y. X is horizontal, Y is vertical. If I was to put my scope in regular mode, okay, uh, doesn't want to behave right now. There we go. That is the X axis input. So that's this follows the sweep. Low to high and high back down to low. And the other signal, if I can get that on. And here superimposed now you can see the actual output of the uh, the, the signal coming back from the uh, TV set. Well, that's a real <laughs> tough to interpret. It's a mess there. So what you do is you put your scope into X and Y mode so that one of these input signals is going to drive the X axis and the other one's going to drive the Y axis. So on my scope, you hit this button here, main, delayed, and it gives you the horizontal mode. You pick X, Y. And now we get this which is a compressed mess, so then you get to play around with the controls. Uh, let's see, so horizontal, over, right about there, and you can control the vertical height, like so. And this last input here is for a variable marker generator that's going to my leader 17A. This does also have built-in markers, but they're fixed frequency, 1, 10, and 100 megahertz. So I played around with the sweep width, and I got it so that I've got two main markers here. This guy and this guy. Which are 10 megahertz apart, so I know that I'm sweeping 20 to 30 megahertz. How did I figure that out? I use my variable marker generator. I've got it on the E range, which is 10 to 35 megahertz. So when I move my frequency control, I see that marker moving around there. That's the output of my RF generator. So if I put it right on top of that blip, which is coming from the wave tech, and look over here on my dial, it's right on 20 megahertz. And this other blip, just to verify where that's at. Right about there. We're right over on just about 30 megahertz. If I turn on the 1 megahertz markers, I got a whole bunch of markers all over the place. So <laughs> the larger markers here and over here are the 10 megahertz markers, and these smaller ones are the 1 megahertz markers. I think that's kind of hard to interpret. It's just too much going on there, so I like to keep it backed off at 10 mark, and then use the variable. All right, I hope that made some sense to you guys. I really don't have to go into this too much detail because I imagine a few if any of you have a 1080 and this hookup is really dependent on what kind of equipment you've got. But in general, you're going to have a sweep generator, you set the center frequency, you set the sweep width, you take the hour off, go to your device under test. In this case, you hook it up through the 6J6 shield. 
you hook up your scope to this point and then depending on you again your scope and your marker generator and or sorry your sweep generator you hook the scope and the sweep generator up your sweep generator may or may not have built-in markers if it does you can just go ahead and use the built-in variable marker generator to get this little blip that you can move around otherwise use an external marker generator or two or three uh, some devices you can hook multiple ge marker generators up and uh, this just makes life a little bit nicer as once you do have this up you are supposed to check to see if it looks like this and notice all these key points 21.25 22 24.3 25.75 you're supposed to put your marker at each one of those frequencies and check to see what these levels are so let's start at the left 21.25 it should be a really really low signal because remember this is the video IF and you don't want the sound bleeding through into the video so Set this to one and a quarter, which is right about there, which is this down here. And it's low, but it's not quite as low as it, sh as it should be. It should be like right down at, at the baseline. And there's a little bit of daylight in between there. And that might be why I was seeing some of that that audio carrier bleeding into the test pattern. Now at 22, it's all right if there's a little bit of daylight. That should be about 85% down from the peak. So, set this. 22. And now we're over here, which looks to me like it's that's a bit too high as well. compared to that. Uh, next up, oh and then of course <laughs> the two peaks should be of equal height and they are not. Or they say should the peak, height of the peak should not exceed by 30 percent and I suppose they don't but I think I can do better. I'm going to try my best to get them to be equal height. All right, so let's see if 24.3 is dead center between those two humps. So back over here, 24. Now I've already checked this RF generator and I know it's pretty accurate, but when you want to get 24.3 in, I got to start kind of guesstimating between these tick marks. So. Uh, frequency counter wouldn't be a bad idea here, but I don't want to hook mine up. I just I don't really ever get too messy. <laughs> uh, all right, so we're not in the center. And finally, 25.75, we should be about 50% down from the peak. And that's not bad. That looks to be about 50% down from the peak. So I think that's all right. Okay, so what did doing all that tell me? It tells me that this is off a bit. 24.3 is not in the center of those two bumps. The bumps are not equal height. And uh, at 21.25, it's not as low as it should be. So now, I will go through and do the alignment. Which, as I said earlier, is actually quite... Easy. And to do the alignment, you actually don't need any of this stuff except for this and this. Okay, I've got my RF generator on the band that goes from 10 to 35 megahertz, and a VTVM is hooked up to the output of the video IF. 
So when I vary this frequency, it's doing just the same thing as the sleep generator was doing. It's going 20 to 30 megahertz. Right now, the meter is very low. As I increase in frequency, the meter goes up. So that's that, that's that curve we saw on the sleep generator. It's going up. Peaks around there, it stays around there for a while, and then it goes back down. So it's low, and went up, cross, and came down. So that is the frequency response of this amplifier. It's designed to have that kind of response. For most frequencies, very little or no gain, and then in around between 22 and 26 megahertz we've got gain. Now, the specific instructions here. Step one, you want the signal generator on 25.3 megahertz. And we're supposed to keep the VTVM on the 3 volt DC scale, which I don't have. I've got a 1.5 and a 5 volt scale, so I'm using the 5 volt scale and you're supposed to keep reducing the generator for a reading of approximately one volt. Well, in that case, I'm going to go down to the 1.5 volt scale. And we're supposed to adjust A1 and A2 for maximum. In other words, put the RF generator 25.3 and peak these two coils, A1 and A2. Where are A1 and A2? All right, let's find out. and right here. So this diagram is pretty useful. They identify each of the coils and show you the frequency that's supposed to be peaked at. So we've got A1 and we've got A2. Those stick out of the top of the chassis and they can be easily adjusted with this tool. So let's get this on 20 5.3 which is going to be... So I just killed my meter. I'm going to turn my level down. We're supposed to keep it at around 1 volt. Which is around there. 25... Three, it's twenty six. So that's right about there. Level down some more. All right. This diagram is kind of like this. <laughs> Transformers towards the back. I have this on its side with the transformer going that way. And these coils are along the side going closest to me, so this must be A1. See, so as soon as I tune that coil a little bit, there's a noticeable effect on the meter. Yeah, it only wasn't off by too much, and I didn't expect it to be. The response wasn't that off. I like to rotate it a bit in the other direction to make sure it's moving freely and that I clearly am at a peak. So, right about there. I'm sorry, A2. Let's just go back here. Whoa, that was way off. 
to rotate this about two complete turns. I should really drop my signal level down a little bit. The idea, the reason being that you drop the signal level down is that if you put too high, too hot a signal in, you're, uh, you're clipping the amplifiers, you're overloading them, and you get a distorted reading. So right about there. And I'll go back and double check the uh, first one here. There we go. Alright. Now we do the same thing at 23.1 megahertz. Now we do A3 and A4, which is this guy. And A4 is actually the tuner itself. This guy. So, 23.1 again and one was off a little bit not horribly but That one wasn't off much either. Alright, that's it. Now I'll hook it back up to the soup generator and let's see what the response curve looks, looks like. Okay, after the alignment, here's what I've ended up with. So, so we can see the peaks are more equal, and let's check those key frequency points. So, at 21.25, the marker should be down to zero, that's the audio. So, I'll get my marker over at 21.25. So, it's way down there, so it's definitely lower than it was before, pretty much down to zero. And then at 22, it's supposed to be about 85% down. We're down here. That looks about right. And then the dip should be at 24.3. That dip in the middle of the response curve there. Let's see. 24.3 yeah that's pretty much right in the middle there and the difference between the dip and the two humps there should be no more than 30 percent of the overall response and I think we're well within that and then finally the 50 percent down mark basically the cross here on the axis should be at 25.75 megahertz right about there and yeah we're pretty good there oh and one last check is the overall response which is defined at the 50% mark 
50% from the baseline to the peak should be about 3.2 megahertz. I've set up my scope display so that each one of these squares is 1 megahertz. So at the axis, going from left to right, we have 1, 2, 3, and change. So I'd say it's about 3.2 megahertz bandwidth. So what difference will that have on the actual display? Let's find out. Here's the resulting frequency response test pattern after the alignment. Not really a whole lot different than it was before, but I wasn't expecting it to be that much different. After all, the response curve wasn't off by that much. Main issue being that the peaks were not of equal height. Something interesting to note though is, see the center bar here, the stripes are not as distinct as on either side. That's the consequence of that double humped response. The frequencies on one side come through nice and strong, and same on the other side. But in the middle, the amplifier doesn't pass the signals through with quite, with quite as much amplification, so it's not as distinct. Ideally, that frequency response is going to go up, be flat across the top, and then come down. But it's a compromise in design. This is a <laughs> what, what for the time was a small tabletop set, so it just doesn't have quite the elaborate IF stages like a staggered tune set would.